Glory, glory, Lord. We give you glory, Lord. Glory, glory, Lord. You are the mighty God. 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 You who go down to the sea. You who live in the islands. Oh, if you live in the city, lift your voice and sing out. Sing out, glory, glory, Lord. We give you glory, Lord. You are the mighty God. You are the mighty God. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing his praise to the ends of the earth. Let every nation tell it, declare it, till every man is heard. Sing out glory, glory, Lord. We give you glory, Lord. You are the mighty God. You are the mighty God. Nani nani Yehova. No ka nani Yehova. Nani nani Yehova. Kea kua mana loa. Vi'ia vi'ia le tua. Matote vi'ia o le tua. Vi'ia, vi'ia, le tua, o, o, le tu mata utia. Glory, glory, Lord. We give you glory, Lord. We give you glory, Lord. And glory, glory, Lord, we do give you glory, Lord. You know, I don't really know that I've shared with you about that song that I play every time as we're getting warmed up to do this, uh, these psalm studies. But uh, that's the name of the song, Glory, Glory, Lord. And after singing that chorus and some other verses a time or two, then it comes back with uh, a verse in Hawaiian. And then it comes in with a verse in... Uh, another uh, another language uh, that has escaped me right now uh, and then comes back to English and, I, and I, I think that could give us a cause for reflection for just a moment that you know there are many many people out there who don't speak English but yet they are giving glory to God in from their hearts expressed in their language. And that gives us a connection. And you know, in this, uh, I don't know, in this time and day in our country and maybe the world, when it seems like we're drawing lines that divide us, that maybe that's something we should remember. That all Christians throughout the world, regardless of, of the language they speak and, and how they dress, and maybe they have a different schedule every day than we do, and things of that nature, we're still one. We're one in Christ Jesus. And you know in the New Testament that that was an issue that Paul addressed among the Jews and the Gentiles. And he says, there is no Jew and Gentile. There is no slave or free. There, there is no male or female. We're all one in Jesus Christ. If we could just get that down and if we could just live that, well, what a different world this, this would be. If those who are not Christians, even those who don't even believe in God, saw how Christians indeed all over the world were united and they were one, that would have a tremendous impact on the world. But I guess that's one of my tittle tangents <laughs> uh, that I do every now and then and uh, so I guess we better get to get to our study this morning 
So we were in, we are in the hundred and fourth psalm, and this group of psalms here, Psalm 103, 104, maybe even some before, and maybe even some after, kind of have the same theme. And, and in particular, in particular, it it talks about blessing God, and we talked about that last week. That uh, that that's really a, an expression of bow the knee to God, give him honor, give him glory, give him praise, which is, which is what we are told to do. So this, this psalm kind of picks up right where 103 left off, just a, a, li a little bit longer, and it, it kind of uses, I guess, 103 as a foundation, but it, it kind of it has its own message today. And so my question for you to consider today as we get into this is when you think God, what comes to your mind? When you think God, what comes to your mind? I'm not particularly <clears throat> asking you or interested in what you think God looks like. I remember Moses wanted to know a little bit, of, a little bit of that way back when, and God said, "Well, you can't see my face, or you'll die." And so He saw some image, some form that was after God had walked past Him. And so, what about that? When you think God, what comes to your mind? And we could. We could answer that question in so many ways. You might think, oh, well, he's the creator. He's God the Father. He could be more specific. He's the Father of Jesus. He's, <clears throat> he's the lover. God is love. God's holy. God's just. All kinds of things that might come to mind, but what would come to your mind first thing? And would it be something like what Psalm 104 is about? So let's get with that today and, and see what we think here about Psalm 104. As we usually do, we'll start by breaking this into sections, and it's kind of detailed this time. Uh, we've got six sections that the, that the Psalm breaks itself into and the first section is verses 1 through 9 which has God as creator which is one thing we just mentioned maybe that's what you think when you think God and then verses 10 through 18 we find God as a dispenser of nourishment and so let's uh, let's be on our metaphorical best <laughs> In our medical for metaphorical best today maybe to determine as he speaks very physically what is the spiritual uh, spiritual lesson for us so verses 10 to 18 is God is a dispenser of nourishment verses 19 to 23 God is presented as master of the seasons master of the seasons that may be somewhat dominant on our minds right now as we've entered spring and going into summer and this is the wet time of, of the year for us and it has certainly proved to be that as well as the season for rough rough weather which we've had ours but those north of us in, in uh, Oklahoma and even further north than that uh, have had their issues uh, with the weather of the springtime going into summer. So God is presented to us in verses 19 through 23 as the master of the seasons. In verses 24 through 26, God is presented to us as the master of land and sea. So when you think about the earth, what else is there, right? There's land and sea, and God is the master of that. Then verses 27 to 30, God is presented to us as the controller of life and death. Life and death are in his hands. 
And then the psalm ends in the last four verses, 31 to 35, as a final prayer. Okay, so this is a rather long psalm, but I do want to, I don't want us to read it together. And we'll be, make our comments as short as we can today. But let's go ahead and read the 104th psalm, starting just like Psalm 103 started for us last week. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty, covering yourself with light as with a garment, stretching out the heavens like a tent. He lays the beams of his chambers on the waters. He makes the clouds his chariot. He rides on the wings of the wind. He set the earth on its foundations that it should never be moved. You covered it with the deep as with a garment. The water stood above the mountains. At your rebuke, they fled. At the sound of your thunder, they took flight. The mountains rose, the valleys sank down to the place that you appointed for them. You set a boundary that they may not pass so that they may not gain again cover the earth. You make springs gush forth in the valleys and they flow between the hills. They give drink to every beast of the field. The wild donkeys quench their thirst. Beside them, the birds of the heavens dwell. They sing among the branches. From your holy uh, lofty abode, you water the mountains. The earth is satisfied with the fruit of your work. You cause the grass to grow for the livestock and plants for man to cultivate that he might bring forth food from the earth and wine to gladden the heart of man, oil to make his face shine, and bread to strengthen man's heart. The trees of the Lord are watered abundantly, the cedars of Lebanon that he planted. In them the birds build their nests, the stork has her home in the fir trees. The high mountains are for the wild goats, the rocks are a refuge for the rock badgers. He made the moon to mark the seasons. The sun knows its time for setting. You make darkness and it is night. And when all the beasts of the forest creep about, the young lions roar for their prey, seeking their food from God. When the sun rises, they steal away and lie down in their dens. Man goes out to his work and to his labor until the evening. O oh Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom have you made them all. The earth is full of your creation. Here is the sea, great and wide, which teems with creatures innumerable, living things both great and small. There go the ships and the Leviathan, which you form to play in it. These all look to you to give them their food in the season. When you give it to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they are filled with good things. When you hide your face, they are dismayed. When you take away their breath, they die and return to their dust. When you send forth your spirit, they are created and you renew the face of the ground. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. Who looks on the earth and it trembles, who touches the mountains and they smoke. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have being. My meditation be pleasing to him. May my meditation be pleasing to him, for I rejoice in the Lord. Let sinners be consumed from the earth, and let the wicked be no more. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Praise the Lord. I'm not really sure that a whole lot needs to be said about this song. Just the way we've divided it kind of makes the lesson appropriate because it's all about God, his power to create, and his mastery over creation. And that's, that's made very vivid to us in, in several ways. So again, when you think God, what comes to your mind? We, we could go to Genesis 1 uh, for a moment here, but uh, we don't want to read Genesis 1 when, and you know the days of creation. 
But in particular, on day four, God creates and puts in place the sun, the moon, and the stars. And this psalm kind of echoes that kind of thing. He put the sun in place to rule the day and the moon in place to rule the night. And we, we read in this psalm, yes, that's, that's, exactly, that's exactly what has happened. As if the psalmist here is confirming what we already know in Genesis chapter 1. He made the moon to mark the seasons. The sun knows its time for setting. You make darkness and it is night when all the beasts of the forest creep about. So it seems like he's saying, you know what? The night provides a couple of things. It provides rest for man and it provides the animals an opportunity to walk about and, and fulfill their hunger. But when the sun rises, the animals go away. They lie down in their dens, it says, and we wake up. We wake up and go to work until the evening. That sounds like a pretty decent schedule, doesn't it? I'm not really sure if we follow that schedule a whole lot uh, these days. Some people work well into the nights to try to get their job done and find themselves sleeping during the day. But what he's saying is fundamentally in God's creation, he made order. And we've already talked about or we mentioned that in that passage from verse 19 to 23 that it shows God as indeed the master of the seasons. And so thinking again, back to Genesis chapter one in the fourth day of creation, he put the sun, the moon, and the stars there, he says, for seasons, for days, and for years. And so they have a very orderly arrangement, a very orderly mission as God put them where they are and their movement like they move to so we can mark when a day starts and ends, so we can mark the different seasons and we can even calculate an entire year. Won't get into the scientific explanation of all that, but don't you see what God's doing here? God has organized creation and then he put mankind there. So in the middle of all of that organization, if you please, done in behalf of man, then he creates man and woman and says, okay, here it is. This is what I've made for you. And I've made it in such a way that you can order your life accordingly. I just, I can't help but say at, at this point that this is exactly what he has done in the scheme of redemption throughout the whole Bible. Jesus' appearance on the scene was not at a random time. Matter of fact, Paul tells us, in the fullness of time, God sent for his son, born of a woman, etc. And it was a very timely appearance of Jesus. And then the mission of Jesus Christ, which carries on even today, was was expressly and in detail laid out for us in the Bible. But it was laid out in the Old Testament in a prophetic fashion and carried out by Jesus, recorded for us in the New Testament. And that's kind of what I'm what I mentioned here at the first. Okay, we can we can look at these aspects of God. He's master of land and sea. And in this section, he, he particularly is, is talking about him making the waters come and he gives them boundaries and then he releases them. And I don't know about you, but that takes me to the flood and Noah. And that rain came because God sent it. And then the rain stopped, so it met its boundaries, couldn't go any further, and then began to recede. You know, we've, we've had almost nothing but rain here in, in North Texas, I want to say, for the past two months. And virtually every day when these thunderstorms come through and we get a severe thunderstorm warning, 
it's followed by a severe flood warning. And then there's all kinds of, of hints about that and what you're supposed to do and what you're not supposed to do in the middle of a flood warning. Well, God is, is the controller of all of that. He's the controller of, of life and death. And we, you know, we read that too, and we might've, we might've hurried over that. Uh, but, uh, he talks about God feeding the animals. Okay. These all look to you and feeding the animals. You hold out your hand, but then you sometimes hide your face from them and you take away their breath and they die and return to dust. But when you send forth your spirit, they are created and you renew the face of the ground. You know, we're, nobody lives forever, not even animals, much less people. That we have a limited time on earth. Well, I can't sit here and say, well, how many years will that be? Because we know people that have lived to be over 100, well over 100. But we also know some people who passed away shortly after birth. And so we, we can't say this is, how, this is how long you're going to live. But what we can say is God is in charge of that. And maybe that, maybe that expresses a lot of questions we can't answer. And maybe we shouldn't answer. But have faith in the fact that God is sovereign. He has not lost control. And that doesn't necessarily mean that he's going to do things like we would like him to do. And so he's, he's the controller of all of that. I think about what the psalmist says, especially in verses 10 to about 23, where we talk about he's the dispenser of nourishment and the master of the seasons and how all of that works together. There's a time, there's a time for things to grow. As a matter of fact, the, uh, the preacher will say that in the book of Ecclesiastes, there's a time to plant and a time to pluck up. I don't know about you, but in my yard right now, it's time to pluck up. <laughs> I can't stay, get ahead of the weeds, but that's, that's our God. And that's, that's who he is. And he controls that. He's the one that, that created that, that cycle every year. Farmers depend on it and they, they, they plant and they harvest their crops according to those seasons. So food gets in the stores today so you and I can have food at the table. And so we, we all depend on this chronology of the seasons uh, that, that God has created. The psalmist says in, in Psalm 89, just reading verses 10 and 11, says, you crushed Rahab like a carcass. So let's don't be confused there. It's not talking about Rahab who was in Jericho uh, that was saved from the destruction of Jericho. This is a creature. You scattered your enemies with your mighty arm. Now, verse 11, the heavens are yours. The earth also is yours. The world and all that is in it, you have founded them. When you think God, what do you think? By that passage, he's the founder of everything. And indeed he is. You know, if, if God had created man and said, okay, man, I'm going to make the world like you want it. I wonder just wonder what we'd come up with. But God, in his foreknowledge and great wisdom, said, well, I'm going to make man, but I'm going to make his world first. And I'm going to organize it in, in such a way that he can function in it, that he can reap the produce of it if he does what I tell him. And then I'll put him right in the middle of it and say, look what I did for you. And that's what this Psalm 104 is saying is this is what God, this is what God did for you. Some people call, especially the, the part of this Psalm that, uh, from 
uh, verse 1 to about verse 23, and maybe all of it, that this is Genesis 1 in poetry. Now, you know, by the nature of the Psalms, they are poems, but we kind of lose the idea of the poetry because that, that those uh, principles, those characteristics of poetry were, are in the Hebrew, and, and we're looking at the English. But for those who know that stuff, they said this is kind of like Genesis 1, but in poetry, in poetic form. So you have, we have Genesis 1 in narrative form in the first chapter of Genesis, and we kind of have the same thing here in a more poetic form. So let's make a point. Since God is the dispenser of nourishment, since God is creator and created everything, since God is the master of the seasons, since God is master of land and sea, since God is controller of life and death, what need your response to be? Would it be the same kind of response that we read in the last several verses of this, of this psalm? May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. You got that? May the Lord rejoice in his works. It's kind of like, but it's more than, at the end of every day of creation practically, God says, and I saw whatever, and it was good, until he came to the finished creation of mankind, and he said, that was very good. That was very good. And here the, the psalmist says, you see, the Lord can rejoice in his works. And maybe a part of that that I might suggest is God rejoicing in his work that is mankind, not only as he sees, God, sees mankind as his creation and puts his image in man, but then he rejoices when man is obedient, faithfully obedient to him, and he rejoices. That prayer goes on to say, who looks on the earth and it trembles, who touches the mountains and they smoke. And so we, uh, we see here the, the, the reaction of God's creation to God. And what is our reaction to the creator, the one who made us and put, uh, put his image in us? We have mountains smoking we have, and as a response to the Creator. And maybe we should also respond in, in such a way, giving God the honor and acknowledging his awesomeness every day of our lives. And so he says, because of all of that, I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have being. My meditation, may my meditation be pleasing to him, for I rejoice in the Lord. Now he ends by saying, let the sinners be done away with, but bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, O my soul. As this thing ends and talks about meditation, that may send us to uh, the 119th Psalm where the psalmist will say, in his law, I meditate day and night. It's where your thinking is, where your brain is, even, even when you're at work, even when you're driving your car. This is, this is where my thinking and my heart is. I will meditate on that. It's really a, a super powerful song, a psalm, as well as being a super beautiful psalm. And so I'll end with the question that we started with. When you think God, what comes to your mind? May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord 
make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious unto you. And may the Lord, the Lord, give you peace. Glory, Lord, we give you glory, Lord, glory, glory, Lord, you are the mighty God.